Good morning and welcome here to St George's United Reformed Church and to our service of worship wherever you may be this morning. We begin by our call to worship from Psalm 19 and invite you to join in with the words that are on the screen. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech, night after night they display knowledge. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the end of the world. We begin our service by singing the hymn, God is here as we his people. Let us come before God in prayer. And we're going to share a prayer written by Anne Honey from the URC Prayer Handbook for this Sunday. Let's pray. Lord, you know our hearts and minds. We don't need fancy words to speak to you. We don't need fine clothes to meet with you. When we put conditions on how to worship, when the instruction manual becomes our gospel, when we put obstacles in the path of those who would come to you, forgive us. Your anger in the temple shows us how much you care, that everyone is welcome that you are wherever we are. You are love unlimited, always accessible. We are grateful that we can turn to you in the dead of night from the depths of our lowest moments and know we will find love, understanding, comfort and acceptance just as we are. Thank you. Amen. Very pleased that Maddie is going to read for us our reading this morning from John's Gospel. 
The video is taken from John, chapter 2, verses 13 to 22. Jesus goes to the temple. It was almost time for the Passover festival, so Jesus went to Jerusalem. There in the temple, he found people selling cattle, sheep and pigeons, and also the money changers sitting at their tables. So he made a whip from cords and drove all the animals out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He overturned the tables of the money changers and scattered their coins. And he ordered those who sold the pigeons, take them out of here, stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that the scripture says, My devotion to your house, O God, burns in me like a fire. The Jewish authorities replied with a question. What miracle can you perform to show us that you have, that you have the right to do this? Jesus answered, Tear down this temple, and in three days, I will build it again. Are you going to build it again in three days? They asked him. It has taken 46 years to build this temple. But the temple Jesus was speaking about was his body. So when he was raised from death, his disciples remembered that he had said this. And they believed the scripture and what Jesus had said. Amen. Thank you, Maddie, for that reading. Our second reading comes from the first letter of Peter, from 1 Peter 2, verse 4. Come to the Lord, the living stone, rejected by the people as worthless, but chosen by God as valuable. Come as living stones and let yourselves be used in building the spiritual temple where you will serve as holy priests to offer spiritual and acceptable sacrifices to God through Jesus Christ. For the scripture says, I chose a valuable stone which I am placing as the cornerstone in Zion and whoever believes in him will never be disappointed. This stone is of great value for you that believe. But for those who do not believe, the stone which the builders rejected as worthless turned out to be the most important of all. And another scripture says, this is the stone that will make people stumble, the rock that will make them fall. They stumbled because they did not believe in the word. Such was God's will for them. But you are the chosen race, the king's priests, the holy nation, God's own people, chosen to proclaim the wonderful acts of God who called you out of darkness into his own marvellous light. At one time you were not God's people, but now you are his people. At one time you did not know God's mercy, but now you have received God's mercy. Thanks be to God for his word. Amen. I want you to recall a place where you have been, which has been a really special place. A place so special that you're amazed that you're actually there. A place so special that you almost fear staying there because it seems so hallowed. I haven't been to a lot of sporting stadiums, but I have been to the grounds at Liverpool and Norwich City, to Twickenham Rugby Stadium. And those places for many people are hallowed ground. I wonder what place it is for you that seemed really special, almost holy, almost magical. I can remember going to the Harry Potter studios when the boys were a little younger and walking into the hall at Hogwarts and being amazed 
and thinking, wow, I'm really here. That seemed a magical, a special place to be. But do you know what spoiled the experience? It was just how much they charged for things. The gift shop there is so expensive. The restaurant is expensive. The guidebooks are expensive. But, of course, once you're in, you can't go anywhere else to buy things. So you're charged over the odds for a drink or to get food from their restaurants. And, of course, you always have to exit through the gift shop. And I guess it's a situation a bit like this in our reading today from the Gospel. What Jesus is so upset about in our reading is how ordinary, everyday people are prevented from worshipping God in the temple. The temple practices that had been developed in such a way that now the poor were being disadvantaged and made it difficult for them to worship God there. There was in the temple a practice of changing money, and it's these money changes that Jesus turns the table on. In the outer courts of the temple at Jerusalem, in the times of Jesus, you would need to change your money, which contained the image of the Roman emperor, for a temple coin, because you could not take any graven image into the temple with you. And the people running the temple would see this as a great way of making money. When people came and changed their money, then the exchange rate would be weighed in the temple's favour. This is just one of the ways in which those in power running the temple found of cheating the poor out of their hard-earned money. You can imagine then that all sorts of other schemes might have been in practice to capitalise on this situation. Imagine bringing your offering to the temple to be sacrificed. This offering should have been the best of your herd or flock. It was the best that you could offer before God as an offering. But what might happen regularly, I'm sure, is that the temple officials would reject your offering as not being good enough and sell you a temple-approved animal, a cost that you no doubt could afford, could not afford. It's a, bit me, it's a bit like me going to a football ground. I've bought my ticket, I've turned up at the right time, but before I can go in, I have to buy a program and a hat and a scarf to wear during the match. Or perhaps you can imagine turning up at church on a Sunday morning and then having to pay to hire a hymn book and pay to have communion. You can imagine what our reactions would be to those situations. The whole list of regulations and requirements had grown so much that it literally became really difficult for the ordinary worshipper to come and enter the temple and make his offering to God. But despite all this, once you entered that temple, it would all be worth it. It would be the most uplifting religious experience. And you would surely say, wow, I'm really here. Just the sheer scale of the place. You would walk up the steps and through the gates and then the central temple would be dazzling. Covered in gold that would just reflect the daylight sun shining on it and just the size and majesty of the place, you would not hesitate to say that God was in this place. Because, of course, for the Jews, this was the only place where God was. When the Jews are wandering around the wilderness with Moses, God instructs them that they, may, they must make a tabernacle, an elaborate tent, And there is much said about the fine details of which this tabernacle is made. This tent in the middle of the desert was what housed the Ark of the Covenant where God resided. God moved around with the people so that wherever they stopped, they would set up the tabernacle 
and God was with them. This was the only place where God could be found. And when the Jews had settled, then Jerusalem became the place where a more grand and elaborate and permanent temple was built that housed the Ark of the Covenant in the Holy of Holies. So if people wanted to worship God, then the temple was the place to be. You might go and see him at an away game, at some other shrines like Bethel and Gilgal. You might worship God there, but the temple was like coming to God's home ground. You can imagine then just the sheer outrage there would have been at what Jesus did in that temple. This was God's place, his home turf. If you could be arrested for stepping on the hallowed turf at Anfield, then I'm sure there would be no hesitation in arresting anyone who caused such a disturbance on that hallowed ground in Jerusalem. And so when Jesus caused such a disturbance, then the leaders of the temple demanded, show us a sign. Let God speak to say who is in the right here. They say to Jesus, if what you are doing in accordance is in accordance with God's will, then let him show us. And Jesus replies, tear the temple down and in three days I will raise it up. That is the sign. And he doesn't mean that he will rebuild with bricks and stones in their current glory. It has taken 46 years so far to get the temple to the glory that it was in Jesus' time. There's no way Jesus meant that he could rebuild it in three days. But Jesus was talking about his body. He says to the religious leaders who, as we will hear in a few weeks' time, will send him to Pilate and Herod to be crucified, Jesus says, tear down this temple and God will rebuild it in three days. And this was something new. This was a whole new theology that Jesus introduces. He says, God is no longer confined to the temple and the Holy of Holies, but he is here, alive and present in the person of Jesus. John's Gospel opens with the words, and the word became flesh and lived among us. The exact translation from the Greek makes perhaps more sense. The word became flesh and tabernacled among us. Jesus was the new tabernacle. Jesus was the new tent in which God resided. He was the temple in which God was housed. Jesus says, tear down this temple and in three days God will raise it up. This will be a sign to you. Jesus doesn't just overturn a few tables in the temple or drive out the sheep. Jesus overthrows the whole religious system, the whole theology, the whole basis for temple worship. This was something new, a complete revolution in thinking. Now, has anyone told you that your body is a temple? What's your normal response? Yes, old and crumbling and falling into ruins. We are now temples because the Holy Spirit, God, resides in us. As God's own people, we are the body of Christ, the temple that has been rebuilt. Peter's letter to the early Christians reinforces this when he says, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. I guess that the question that comes today is what kind of state 
would Jesus find our temple in? As we consider the society that we have built and all that is wrong with the world today, how would Jesus react when he saw the injustice and the unfairness around us? Would he tear through us with righteous anger, overturning all those things that are wrong with us? Would he drive out from us the ways in which we have taken his freely given love and used it for our own gain? Would he overturn in us the very understanding of our relationship with God and cause a revolution? As we continue through Lent, we look to our own lives and the society of which we are part, and we consider how we can make them ready for the new life which comes through the death of Jesus on the cross. We consider how we can be made ready to allow God to take up residence in our lives and in ourselves so that we may glorify him in our worship and in our living. Amen. I want to stay with that image of ourselves as the temple, the house of God, and to invite Jesus into this house to look around. And just as Jesus clears out the temple in the passage from John's Gospel, we ask ourselves what Jesus would clear out from our lives were he to have a good look around. We're going to use our imaginations to show Jesus around our lives as we imagine this house and are led through a guided meditation based on one called My Heart, Christ's Home by Robert B. Munger. It begins. One evening I invited Jesus Christ into my heart. What an entrance he made. It was not a spectacular emotional thing, but very real. Something happened at this very center of my life. He came into the darkness of my heart and turned on the light. He built a fire on the hearth and banished the chill. 
He started the music where there had been silence. He filled the emptiness with his own loving, wonderful fellowship. I have never regretted opening the door to Christ, and I never will. In the joy of the new relationship, I said to Jesus Christ, Lord, I want this heart of mine to be yours. I want to have you settle down here and be perfectly at home. Everything that I have belongs to you. Let me show you around. And so, in your imagination, I'm going to invite you to show Jesus around your own life, just as you might show him around your house. Think about the various areas of your life as you go from room to room and ask yourself what Jesus would think about what he saw and ask him to clear out all those things that are not worthy to be in God's house. So let us pray with God. The first room was the study, the library. In my home, this room of the mind is a very small room with very thick walls. But it's a very important room. In a sense, it's the control room of the house. Jesus entered with me and looked around at the books on the bookcase, the magazines on the table and the pictures on the walls. As I followed his gaze, I became uncomfortable. Strangely, I had not felt self-conscious about this before, but now that he was looking at these things, I was embarrassed. Some books were there that his eyes were too pure to behold. On the table were a few magazines that a Christian had no business reading. As for the pictures on the walls, the imaginations and thoughts of the mind, some of these were shameful. Red-faced, I turned to him and said, Master, I know that this room needs to be cleaned up and made over. Will you help me make it what it ought to be? Certainly, he said. I'm glad to help you. First of all, take all the things that you are reading and looking at which are not helpful, pure, good and true and throw them out. Now put on the empty bookshelves the books of the Bible. Fill the library with scripture and meditate on it day and night. As for the pictures on the walls, you will have difficulty controlling these things. But I have something that will help. And he gave me a full-size portrait of himself. Hang this centrally, he said, on the wall of the mind. From the study, we went into the dining room, the room of appetites and desires. I spent a lot of time and hard work here to satisfy my wants. I said to him, this is my favourite room. I am quite sure you will be pleased with what we serve. He seated himself at the table and asked, what's on the menu for dinner? Well, I said, my favourite dishes, money, academic degrees, stocks and shares with newspaper articles of fame and fortune as side dishes. They were the things I liked, secular fare. And when the food was placed before him, he said nothing. But I observed that he did not eat it. I said to him, Master, don't you care for this food? What's the trouble? He answered, I have food to eat that you do not know of. If you want food that really satisfies you, do the will of the Father. Stop seeking your own pleasures, desires and satisfaction. Seek to please him. That food will satisfy you. There at the table, he gave me a taste of the joy of doing God's will. What flavour! There is no food like it in the world. 
it alone satisfies. From the dining room, we walked into the living room. This room was intimate and comfortable. I liked it. It had a fireplace, overstuffed chairs, a sofa, and a quiet atmosphere. He said, this is indeed a delightful room. Let us come here often. It is secluded and quiet, and we can fellowship together. Well, as a young Christian, I was filled, thrilled. I couldn't think of anything I would rather do than have a few minutes with Christ in close companionship. He promised, I will be here every morning. Meet me here and we will start the day together. So morning after morning, I would come downstairs to the living room. He would take a book of the Bible from the case. We would open it and read it together. He would unfold to me the wonder of God's saving truths. My heart sang as he shared the love and grace he had towards me. They were wonderful times. However, little by little, under the pressure of many responsibilities, this time began to be shortened. Why? I'm not sure. I thought I was too busy to spend regular time with Christ. This was not intentional, you understand. It just happened that way. Finally, not only was the time shortened, but I began to miss days now and then. Urgent matters would crowd out the quiet times of conversation with Jesus. I remember one morning, rushing downstairs, eager to be on my way, I passed the living room and noticed that the door was open, and looking in, I saw a fire in the fireplace and Jesus was sitting there. Suddenly, in dismay, I thought to myself, He is my guest. I invited him into my heart. He has come as my saviour and friend, and yet I am neglecting him. I stopped, turned and hesitantly went in. And with downcast glance, I said, Master, forgive me. Have you been here all these mornings? Yes, he said. I told you I would be here every morning to meet with you. Remember, I love you. I have redeemed you at great cost. I value your friendship, even if you cannot keep the quiet time for your own sake. Do it for mine. The truth that Christ desires my companionship, that he wants me to be with him and waits for me, has done more to transform my quiet time with God than any other single fact. Don't let Christ wait alone in the living room of your heart, but every day find time when, with your Bible and in prayer, you may be together with him. Before long, he asked, do you have a workroom in your home? And out in the garage of the home of my heart, I had a workbench and some equipment, but I was not doing much with it. Once in a while, I would play around with a few little gadgets, but I wasn't producing anything substantial. I led him out there. He looked over the workbench and said, well, this is quite well furnished. What are you producing with your life for the kingdom of God? He looked at one or two little toys that I'd thrown together on the bench and held one up to me. Is this the sort of thing you are doing for others in your Christian life? Well, I said, Lord, I know it isn't much and I really want to do more, but after all, I don't seem to have strength or skill to do more. Would you like to do better, he asked. Certainly, I replied. All right, let me have your hands. Now relax in me and let my spirit work through you. I know that you are unskilled, clumsy and awkward. But the Holy Spirit is the master workman. And if he controls your hands and your heart, he will work through you. Stepping around behind me and putting his strong hands under mine, he held the tools in his skilled fingers and began to work through me. The more I relaxed and trusted him, the more he was able to do with my life. He asked me if I had a recreation room 
where I went for fun and fellowship. I was hoping he would not ask about that. There were certain associations and activities that I wanted to keep for myself. One evening when I was way out going out with my buddies, he stopped me with a glance and asked, are you going out? I replied, yes. Good, he said, I would like to go with you. Oh, I answered rather awkwardly. I don't think, Lord Jesus, that you would really enjoy where we are going. Let's go out together tomorrow night. Tomorrow night we'll go to a Bible class at the church, but tonight I have another appointment. I'm sorry, he said. I thought that when I came into your home we were going to do everything together, to be close companions. I just want you to know that I am willing to go with you. Well, I mumbled, slipping out the door. We will go someplace together tomorrow night. That evening I spent some miserable hours. I felt rotten. What kind of friend was I to Jesus, deliberately leaving him out of my life, doing things and going places that I knew very well he would not enjoy? When I returned that evening, there was a light in his room and I went up to talk it over with him. I said, Lord, I've learned my lesson. I know now that I can't have a good time without you. From now on, we will do everything together. Then he went down into the rec room of the house. He transformed it. He brought new friends, new excitement and new joys. Laughter and music have been ringing through the house ever since. One day, I found him waiting for me at the door. An arresting look was in his eye. And as I entered, he said to me, there's a peculiar odour in this house. Something must be dead around here. It's upstairs. I think it's in the hall closet. As soon as he said this, I knew what he was talking about. There was a small closet up there on the hall landing, just a few feet square. In that closet... Behind lock and key, I had one or two little personal things that I did not want anyone to know about. Certainly, I didn't want Christ to see them. I knew they were dead and rotting things left over from the old life. I wanted them so for myself that I was afraid to admit that they were there. Reluctantly, I went up with him. And as we mounted the stairs, the odour became stronger and stronger. He pointed to the door I was angry. That's the only way I can put it. I had given him access to the library, the dining room, the living room, the workroom, and now he was asking for for me about the little two-by-four closet. And I said to myself, this is too much. I am not going to give him the key. Well, he said, reading my thoughts, If you think I'm going to stay up here on the second floor with this smell, you are mistaken. I'll go out on the porch. And then I saw him start to go down the stairs. When one comes to know and love Christ, the worst thing that can happen is to sense him withdrawing his fellowship. I had to give in. I'll give you the key, I said sadly. But you will have to open the closet and clean it out. I haven't got the strength to do it. Just give me the key, he said. Authorize me to take care of that closet, and I will. With trembling fingers, I passed the key to him. He took it, walked over to the door, opened it, entered, took out all the putrefying stuff that was rotting in there and threw it away. Then he cleansed the closet and painted it. It was all done in a moment's time. What victory and release to have that dead thing out of my life. A thought came to me. Lord, is there any chance that you would take over the management of the whole house and operate it for me as you did that closet? Would you take the responsibility to keep my life what it ought to be? His face lit up as he replied, I'd love to. That is what I want to do. You cannot be a victorious Christian in your own strength. Let me do it through you and for you. That is the way. 
But he added slowly, I am just a guest. I have no authority to proceed since the property is not mine. And dropping to my knees, I said, Lord, you have been a guest and I have been the host. From now on, I am going to be the servant. You are going to be the owner and master. Running as fast as I could, I took the strong box, I took out the title deed to the house, describing its assets and liabilities, its location and situation. I eagerly signed the house over to him alone for time and eternity. Here, I said, here it is, all that I am and all that I have forever. Now you run the house. I'll just remain with you as a servant and friend. Things are different since Jesus Christ has settled down and has made his home in my heart. Amen. Jesus Christ, we give to you our whole body, mind, soul and heart. Take these things and come and live within us. Cleanse our thoughts, cleanse our minds, cleanse our deeds. May we be worthy temples of the Holy Spirit. May God fill that space within us that as we go about our work this week that we take God with us and through our hands and through our words God's presence may be felt in the lives of those we meet and may we recognise the presence of God in those who meet with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Thank you for joining with us in worship this morning. It's been good to worship with you in this way. Go now in peace to love and serve the Lord. And may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, be with you this day and for all the days to come. Amen.